Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, uh, Byron Vosberg from uh, San Diego Clean Power. Uh, he's incredibly well, given that he's only been out of Stanford for 10 years, incredibly <laughs> well qualified to do this, as I'll now summarize. Uh, he did a undergrad here in biological systems and a master's in it, uh, earth, uh, earth and Atmosphere and Civil and Environmental Engineering. I know some of you are in that. Many of you, I think, are in that uh, program about 10 years ago. And then uh, uh, actually and actually was a bandmate, I just discovered, with our own Sarah Weaver at that time, playing uh, first trombone, I think. Uh, he then went to PG&E. Uh, and from there, went to um, Marin Clean Power, a community choice ag aggregator in Marin County. Uh, then went to... I had to look this up. The Energy Authority and stood up, helped st stand up their uh, Clean Power um, Alliance, yep. Clean Power Alliance programs, uh, and then got uh, offered a great job, which he hasn't actually showed up for, but works remotely <laughs> on running the Community Choice Aggregator called San Diego Clean Power. So I'm very excited. I did warn him that we have heard a little bit from previous speakers, particularly our regulators, about Community Choice Aggregator aggregators, mostly good, but kind of the good and the bad, the ugly. So I've encouraged him to fight back and say what he doesn't like or like about <laughs> regulation of energy systems in California. Oh. So without further ado, Byron uh, Vosberg. Great. Thank you. Th thanks, y'all. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Is it good distance? This is new, I think, with the mask and the, and the mic, but we'll give it a shot and, and see how this goes. Um, yeah, thanks for that, that introduction. Uh, yeah, I, I will say this is a little surreal to be back. I think I think what, 10, 10, 12 years ago, I was there watching people present up here. So it's uh, it's good to be back. Didn't necessarily think I'd be here, but but here we are. And again, happy to happy to share uh, and share with you guys uh, about CCA, uh, Community Choice Aggregation in in California. Uh, it sounds like you guys may have some uh, introduction to this previously. So I've got uh, a few different sections of slides here to kind of go through as much as we want or as little as we want. Um, if you guys want to make it conversational, ask questions as we go. That's totally, totally fine. It's way more fun to, to be in a discussion than just me, talk, me talking at you for 45 minutes. Um, so that, that sounds just fine. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, and jump in. So pretty simple here on the table of contents. What is CCA? Uh, hope, again, hopefully that's a pretty basic question, but we'll go over that again. Uh, who is SDCP, San Diego Community Power? Uh, and then again, the, all, all the fun stuff at the end is just kind of energy fundamentals in, in California from kind of the CCA perspective. So what is CCA? Um, uh, again, really high level. Uh, in 2000, we had an energy crisis here in, in California. Um, as I think about it, that was like middle school for me. So I remember it's, <laughs> it's pretty, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, I remember growing up in California. I remember being here through the energy crisis kind of led to uh, again, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger became a governor. They were they were tied together. PG&E went bankrupt shortly thereafter. Um, realize how many of you are actually born after 2000? Really? All right, that's moment one of me feeling like an old man. Uh, but okay, so anyway, so California, we had rolling blackouts last year. We had them again in, previously in 2000. Uh, so that was uh, part of, I guess, what stemmed this uh, or, or created this CCA movement. Uh, was it in 2002, coming out of that, there was, and I won't say it was really an afterthought, but there was a, uh, a part of the energy legislation that said that communities can join together to procure power on behalf of their customers, um, kind, of, kind of a carve out, but it wasn't really thought of much at that, at that time. Uh, again, this is 2002 coming out of the, the energy crisis in 2000. Um, 2011 then, of course, there was more legislation as well, um, but it really shows you there was <laughs> eight or nine years with not a whole lot going on in, in community choice energy. Um, you know, the, the three utilities, the IOUs, PG&E, Edison, and, and San Diego Gas and Electric, um, kind of emerged from, emerged from the ener energy crisis, and there was a lot of um, a, a reorganization, right, a lot of, a lot, a lot of new regulation um, in, in California uh, from that, but nothing really on this side of CCA. Um, we'll get to it, the timeline here in a minute, but just in general, how CCA works, again, kind of envisioned at the time, but, but not really in 2002 when it was, when it was allowed, is that the CCA, uh, the, again, Community Choice Aggregator, so I'll use CCA frequently, it's, it's a whole lot, whole lot easier, um, procures the electricity on behalf of customers uh, or, or a community, kind of joins with other communities, towns, counties, 
uh, in a local area. They go sign contracts for power and deliver it to customers. Um, the delivery in the middle, and I realize this is really oversimplified, but, it, but again, it, it, it makes it nice and easy. Delivery in the middle is still transmission and distribution, so that's still the IOU, the investor-owned utility, again, in Northern California, PG&E. So they're still delivering the energy on behalf of the customers. Uh, and then obviously, you, so you, <laughs> in this case, uh, the CCA procures the electricity, the IOU, uh, whatever the utility, uh, delivers it, and then the customer receives it, right? It's really the same. The only real change is on that left side. Now it's CCAs procuring energy instead of the, uh, the fully vertically integrated IOUs. Um, the benefits, um, obviously, of CCA are that pr primarily local control, right? So you have, instead of decisions being made in boardrooms, being made by the IOUs, being regulated by the, the PUC, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, you have boards of local elected officials um, who are responsive to their local communities making these decisions in instead. So primarily, CCA is focused on climate impact, so increasing renewables, re reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also having local impacts in, in their local areas. Um, pr another key benefit here is competition, right? So just by virtue of introducing a second utility or, or load-serving entity, uh, in, the, in these places where again, you've had monopolies for, for decades, uh, you get competition and you force the IOUs in some ways, you encourage them to be a little cheaper, be a little greener, provide better products as well. So not only does the CCA try to do its own thing um, and, and be more renewable, be responsive to its local communities, but also you introduce a little bit of competition. Um, you increase green energy choices. Uh, CCAs typically have one, two, maybe three product offerings for their, for their customers. We'll get into more, a little bit more of that uh, down the road. But again, just choice. Customers can stay with the IOU, with the utility, or join the CCA. Um, and if they're in the CCA, then they have, again, usually two or three different product offerings. Um, Community-based programs as well. So these decisions, as I said earlier, really are driven at the local level. So you can target your programs based on what your community is interested in. If you're really interested in energy efficiency or electric vehicles or all of the above, you, but you, you can target those programs in a way that meets your community and meets their needs uh, instead of just doing kind of the statewide or half of the statewide um, approach of the, of the IOUs. Um, you can focus local economic development jobs in your local area as well, not just, again, kind of statewide. Um, and then another important aspect of this, too, is that you do have uh, local and transparent decision-making. So all the decisions are made in public board meetings by people who are responsive to their local uh, customers as well, and so if they have questions, you know, it, it, everything's kind of done, done in public, um, and I think that really does just kind of help the overall uh, process as well. So with a little bit of a history here, um, you can see on the right side just kind of this time, the timeline of CCA formation. I mentioned that in 2002 um, it was kind of the, the legislation that allowed for CCA, but you don't really, you don't see it. The first CCA was Marine Clean Energy, formed in 2010. So again, this wasn't really like a um, it wasn't a watershed or, or wasn't really intentional at the time that they were going to form this in 2002 and then everything would run from there. Um, this really came from, like in Marin County, um, some folks that were, were looking to figure out how they could reduce their emissions and said, hey, our energy, energy supply um, is one of, our <laughs> one of our biggest sources of emissions. How can we increase renewables, reduce uh, carbon intensity, and ha have a biggest impact? So from, again, this was kind of during the, the mid, early to mid-2000s, uh, Marine Clean Energy was, was busy doing that and then launched in 2010. You can see then uh, <laughs> it moved from Marin up to Sonoma. Uh, Sonoma Clean Power launched in 2014, um, and it kind of was a, a slow, slow growth uh, at first, but really ha community choice has taken off. You can see from 2015, 16, 17, a few more here and there, and then 2018 uh, launch of, what is that, 12, 11, 12, uh, new CCAs uh, into 2020 and, and 2021. So the left side, again, on the map, uh, you can see how many uh, communities now are either serving load as CCAs uh, or are considering it. So it really has become popular, has um, demonstrated, uh, I guess, <laughs> uh, the, the benefits uh, and the impact that CCA can have. And again, especially with increased renewables, um, reduced carbon emissions, uh, really is a popular way for a lot of these local communities uh, to meet their carbon targets as well. Um, let's see, ne next slide, again, just to show in a di different form here. This is on, starts in 2016, I believe, yeah. Um, so you can see left to right, just this <laughs> kind of uh, enormous growth 
uh, and you don't really think about uh, growth like this in industries that are you know usually electric utility, um, but uh, large growth from, from again from left to right just in total load served by CCAs here in California. Um, and the next one, just to look at PG&E, SoCal Edison, and SDG&E over the last three years, and this is a bit of a teaser because I'll get into San Diego in just a minute, um, but 2020, 21, and 22 left to right, uh, you can see PG&E has kind of already had most of their load or, or most of their load that it has departed, uh, has, you know, it's kind of been steady over these last three years. About 50% of what was originally PG&E's load is now served by CCAs. SoCal Edison down south, uh, southern, most, most of Southern California except San Diego, um, you know, is right there around 17, 20, 21 percent. Um, San Diego Gas and Electric, you can see as of 2020, was at zero percent, <laughs> is 19 percent this year, and next year will be 47-ish uh, ish percent. Again, these numbers are, are moving a little bit, um, but that's where, where we come in. Um, SDCP is a, a brand new organization, founded in 2019, but we started serving load this uh, this year in March, and so that's kind of what we see here as San Diego Clean Power. Again, kind of a, a startup within the utility space. You <laughs> something, certainly didn't think uh, I'd get to be part of a, a startup here in the utility space, but, but here we are, uh, taking uh, almost half of SDG&E's load over the first couple of years. I'll pause there. Are there any questions? Did I go over anything that was gloss over anything too quickly? Anything you guys want to go in more depth or any questions that have come up so far? That's a really good question. So the question, I think, in case you guys can't hear for the, the live stream that I'm sure all my, all my fans are diving into, uh, is who, who pays for transmission or, or maintenance of lines? And so it's a really good question. And we, I guess the, all of the rates are kind of broken out into generation rates or then transmission and distribution rates. And so the transmission distribution rates are the same, and they get paid to the IOUs or the, the utilities. So PG&E, Edison, even for CCA customers, still get paid for transmission distribution. There are a lot of other <laughs> other charges <laughs> we will spare you guys from for now, but there are you know, larger um, you know, public good kind of charges uh, that everybody pays, but it's the generation rate um, then is the rate that the CCAs pay. Uh, and it's either, you know, if you're a CCA customer, you'll pay the CCA generation rate. If you're a utility customer, you'll, you'll pay theirs. But really good question. Yeah. Um, in Edison, why is it so slow? It's, it's a good question. I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer, um, but I, I think that there, there was one um, large CCA, again, Clean Power Alliance in Southern California, Edison Territory. I think they, they formed and they have 31 communities. So it, they've kind of been um, one CCA that kind of stood up and took most of that. Um, I, I think in, from the competitive landscape, I think Edison is also a little tougher to compete against. Um, PG&E has higher rates, and so it's a little easier for a CCA to, to, to compete. Um, and, and, and I think in, in a lot of ways, um, some of the politics, <laughs> I'll say, around PG&E have probably made it easier for, for folks to opt for a different option as well. Um, so there's no, per, no, no, no uh, I don't know, no perfect answer there, but, um, or determining factor, but, but I think certainly, you know, PG&E has had a, a, a rough couple decades, right? You've seen the, the wildfires, a couple bankruptcies, and, um, you know, I think for pol politicians especially, they're probably a little more eager to, to find an alternative to PG&E than, than maybe SoCal Edison. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll keep going, um, but just to, to show kind of the impact that the CCAs have had, and, and again, this is really um, a, a new... <laughs> a new field in some ways, a, a new organization. Um, but even in the few years that CCA has been around, uh, again, Marine Clean Energy has been around for ab about a decade, uh, but most others are, you know, <laughs> a, a few months to a, a few years old. Uh, even in that time, CCAs have signed signed contracts for 10 gigawatts of, of new, new build, um, you know, renewables and storage capacity in, in California. So, um, you know, that, that's... For scale, right, the, the capacity of California, peak, peak load in California in summer days, maybe 50 gigs, right? So that's, you, know, you, we, you build more to have a planning reserve margin, but, you know, that's, that's a, a fifth of the capacity or thereabouts of a peak day. Um, and you can see in 2018, again, some of the data may be stale, sorry, but in, in 2018 alone, right, CCAs averaged 47% renewable energy compared to the IUs that were 35 
and then from a total carbon-free perspective, um, which includes the renewable energy, but um, uh, it is incremental. So usually it's either hydro or, or nuclear as carbon-free, but not technically renewable. Um, CCAs have been about 85% carbon-free, whereas the IOUs are, are 59. So to show you the impact that, that the CCAs have had just over this period um, in, again, increasing renewables, increasing carbon-free deliveries, and reducing greenhouse gas em emissions. Um, and from 2011 to 2019, CCAs purchased twice as much energy as, as mandated by the RPS. So it's the renewable, man renewable portfolio uh, standard, which, which again is increasing, um, which again, California leading, leading the way, right, in, in the states uh, in a lot of ways um, with, with the RPS that we've had here for, for over a decade now. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, I just coughed into a mask. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was awkward. Um, but the uh, but we've we've had the RPS, which really has kind of paved the way and encouraged the IOUs to be more renewable. The CCAs themselves have, have doubled that, right? So because they there are intent on having local control, keeping rates competitive, if not cheaper, but also on you know focused on the the, the carbon impact and the climate impact, um, have been able to do that here and and kind of outpace the the uh, incumbent IOUs. And then the um, we'll see. Oh, so down below, yeah. So 64 uh, CCA, CCA communities have an option. Uh, to default to 100% renewable energy, which wasn't really possible before, before then, right? Some of the IUs kind of did have 100% renewable programs for individual customers, but not for a community as a whole. Um, so especially as, as a lot of the communities want to meet their, their climate uh, targets, um, this is the climate action plans, right? This is really a way for them to do that, to elect, um, uh, elect renewable or, or carbon-free service. <coughs> Excuse me. So beyond that, um, beyond just the, the energy production itself, um, you've got custom localized uh, customer programs. So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but again, having local control, local decision making, allows CCAs to f you know look at their local community and figure out what programs suit them best. How do they want to uh, allocate their funds? How do they want to design their programs to really have the impacts that, that meet their communities um, you know better than again kind of a, a broad brush that works for all of California. Um, so th these are. You, uh, on the left, you can see Clean Power Alliance. And on the right side, East Bay Community Energy. They have their local business development plans, local program plans um, for everything from, again, building decarbonization, demand response, energy efficiency, electrification, uh, y you name it. Um, but e each CCA then forged local community with involvement of its, uh, again, of its board members, its community um, you know, advisor committees. Uh, is kind of builds these and then this sets a framework for their, their customer programs instead of them just being run through, through the IOUs. And then finally, um, you know, we talk a lot about you know, greening the infrastructure, also greening the jobs um, and creating green jobs. So CCs have been able to work with all of these local unions as well. Um, and, and so this is, again, <laughs> it is, is beneficial overall for the state, for the economy, but also for a lot of the um, politicians, <laughs> again, right, who, who want to promote CCA, this is really big for them as well. Um, you know, it's a great talking point. Uh, beyond just the climate impacts, you're also improving, uh, you know, jobs, in increasing jobs and in, in, in paying good union, uh, union labor as well throughout California. So that's the overview of CCA. We're, I think about halfway through. I'll get to SDCP here in a minute, but I'll, I want to pause again in case there are any questions, clarifications. Oh man, that's a good question. Um, most of them, <laughs> to get into the, the nitty gritty, most of them are joint powers authorities. So it's a not, nonprofit organization, which is run, kind of governed by um, a governing board, which has representatives from a number of communities. So I, I'll give you an example here with SDCP that might make a little more sense, uh, but they're independent organizations. Um, again, kind of stood up as similar to joint action agencies um, if, in some ways, but it's a joint powers authority. So independent of the cities they serve, but governed by uh, those cities. Yeah, to the CCA. The revenue goes directly to the CCA. Yeah. Any other questions? Good question, um, and let's go back. So the question was, uh, and again, you guys are, you guys are, are well well read, and these are these are really good questions. Um, so we'll go to the the map here. But the question was around serving higher income communities. Um, yeah, I, I think 
certainly it's not just higher income communities, but I think that's where a lot of the uh, certainly where a lot of number of the programs initially started and rolled out. Right. Um, I think in some way, I, I, I think it's fair to say <laughs> some of these areas also overlap with a lot of the um, more progressively minded uh, communities as well that want to focus on uh, want to focus on climate and, and want to put that forth. Um, and make it a priority. So I think that really is the, the biggest driver. We have seen a lot of CCAs. It's not just uh, not just for uh, higher income areas, um, but it certainly you know, has started out that way. We certainly do see CCAs as well in you know, lower income areas. Um, that and and in some ways is the the beauty of the local design of each program is that some in you know wealthier communities can choose. We want to be 100% renewable. We don't really care if it's 10% more expensive. We want it, that, that's our thing. And we want, you know, free EV charging for everyone or, or whatever, whatever their goals may be. Others that are more economically focused can say, yep, we want to be renewable, you know, as renewable, maybe a little more renewable, but we really want to be focused on rates. And you can kind of design your own program based on your own communities. Um, so we have, we have seen a number of those programs kind of stand up as well. Um, but yeah, g again, good question. Any other questions? Okay. So San Diego Community Power. Sorry, I'm making a, a mess up here. Um, who is SDCP? So San Diego Community Power is, and again, this gets to the, <laughs> the organization question, um, is a, again, a joint powers authority. I, I didn't plan to, <laughs> to bring that word up, but uh, it's the organizational structure of, of SDCP. Um, and it is kind of, again, governed by the representing and serving these five member communities. So San, the city of San Diego itself on, on the right there, and then four other neighboring communities as well, uh, La Mesa, Imperial Beach, Encinitas, and Chula Vista. Um, the slide soon to be out of date. We do have another couple communities joining us in 2023 as well. So we'll have a couple more there. Um, but really, you know, focused again on San Diego and the San Diego area and serving these, these, these customers. Um, so again, not to belabor the point, but SDCP here, then we've got a, a board of five members, uh, one each uh, representing each of these, these member communities. And that, again, the board will grow to seven as we have seven member communities down the road as well. So just to, I guess, make a, a, a provide a case study, right, in CCA and how this all works, um, the history here <laughs> starts for SDCP in, in 2019 um, when we filed our implementation plan. So um, a, a number of, uh, I think, community members and activists in, in the San Diego area have been you know, pushing for CCA for a long time, again, noting the benefits, especially on the, on the climate side. Um, but in 2019, kind of, you know, the organizations came together, filed the uh, implementation plan, and kind of, you know, uh, established the JPA. Um, and then really from, you know, 2020 was a startup year of, of hiring some folks and getting, you know, <laughs> some consultants and vendors in, in place. Um, and then 2021, we, we, this year, we started serving load. So it really is a, a startup in that, you know, going from 2019, from filing documents to serving load and actually being responsible as a load serving entity, um, buying power in the wholesale markets and, and selling to customers. You're doing all that kind of within two years. So 2021, um, we started um, serving customers. We're, again, we've got a, a, phased, <laughs> a phased enrollment, so we're not bringing on, you know, 900 megawatts of customers all at once. Uh, we rolled in uh, just a, a, a small first tranche in March with our um, government and kind of quasi-government accounts. Um, and we brought in a large number of customers, all the commercial and industrial customers, and in June of this year. So currently that's kind of our customer base, about 60,000 total. And then uh, next spring, over a four-month period from February through May, we're bringing in all the residential customers. So going from about 60, 000, or 60, 70,000 customers, bringing in another 700,000 customers. Again, smaller customers, but it should double us or, or thereabouts in size uh, to be you know, about you know, 900 megawatts average um, next year. So this slide, of course, is, is out of date as well. Um, we, the county of San Diego, as well as National City, another uh, city nearby, neighboring city, um, have both voted to join recently as well. So we'll need to clean this up, but they'll be joining us uh, again uh, in 2023, and then you know, we'll be growing by about another 25 or 30 percent in another year after. Uh, let's see. This just outlines kind of our specific enrollment schedule. I don't think you guys are too <laughs> too concerned about that, um, but you know the values for SDCP really are similar to what we've seen from a lot of other CCAs. Right? It really is about choice and, and the competition. Um, that we provide in, in the local community. And, and I, I should have made it clear early on, right? CCA is formed 
and becomes the default energy provider. So all the customers who are currently being served by the utility get transitioned over. But in <laughs> true to the, the, the name choice, those customers, if they prefer service from SoCal Edison, SDG&E, or pg &E, they can opt, opt out and, and go right back if they'd like. Um, so it, again, at, at worst, you're providing a new alternative and, and people can go back if they really like the utility service. But again, at best, you're providing new options, new programs for these people to enroll in. Um, Let's see. So again, local, open, accountable, um, right? We're transparent. We're <laughs> all of our board meetings. If you guys <laughs> having trouble falling asleep some nights, you can go online and watch our board meetings. They're all there. Um, you know, sometimes three, four, five hours long, and, and it, you know, um, but it's all done in public, right? So it, everything, you know, there, there are no kind of back, backdoor conversations or backroom meetings. It's all kind of in public um, when as those decisions are made. Um, and then again, we're looking at the customer impact and, and community investment, right? So same thing there. And we've got our, our community advisory committee. So they also serve, um, you know, just members of our local community on a committee. Um, we review a lot of our kind of decisions and planning with them. They then provide recommendations as well to our board um, as part of our process. Uh, and then we want to be 100% renewable. So um, I, I think this is part of our marketing <laughs> documentation here. You can see we're the first CCA to reach 100, to uh, codify the goal. Uh, to be 100% renewable by 2035 in our founding agreement. I think other CCAs also have a goal to be 100% renewable, but we're the first one, obviously, to do it in our foundational document. Um, so we're pretty pretty proud of that and, and plan now to be 100% renewable by, by 2035, if not sooner. Um, again, similar values that you see across a lot of CCAs here as well. Support for local jobs, right? Local investment, local jobs, really important, um, you know, as opposed to, Again, just kind of these, the, the main difference, you guys are probably tired, tired of hearing me say it, but it really is about the, the local control and, and being able to direct your programs, direct your jobs, direct your investment to something that fits your community a whole lot better than, again, just this broad brush works for California and, and who knows where the jobs end up. No, you can really direct them kind of community by community and program by program. Um, also, a, a huge focus for us is, is on equity as well. So kind of get into the question around, you know, is this just for the high-income communities on the coastal communities, um, right, SDCP? And, and most CCAs as well, if not all CCAs, focus on equity as well. But SDCP, really, we take it to heart. Um, so we have incentives as well um, in, you know, communities of concern uh, to, to site, program, to site uh, facilities there and also to provide additional benefits to, to those communities. Um, saving money in the environment, right? I mean, I think that, that, <laughs> that goes without saying. That's kind of what CCAs are, are here for. So we obviously want to increase renewables, r reduce uh, you know, greenhouse gases, also save money or at least you know, provide competitive rates to, to what the alternative is with SDG&E. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned before, run locally uh, and community focused. So um, you know, our, our customers are, uh, are, are us. <laughs> I, I'm actually one of the few who still hasn't moved to San Diego. <laughs> so, so this doesn't apply to me, but the rest of my coworkers are, are down there in San Diego uh, and, and our customers and, and our residents. So SDCP itself, uh, again, we have, I mentioned earlier, two standard products, um, or one, one standard and one optional, but kind of two service offerings to customers. These are available to all of our residential customers, all of our business customers, um, and if communities want to opt their customers up to one or the other, they, they can. Um, it kind of is the default product, so I think one of our communities opted actually that all of their accounts will automatically start in the Power 100 product. Um, so power on is, again, the standard service, 50% renewable, um, which is above the you know, renewable portfolio standard of a requirement of 36%, I think, this year. So 40% renewable. And then we've got an additional 5% so, uh, of, uh, of carbon-free energy. And again, we've got, we don't buy any nuclear energy, so that's just uh, carbon-free hydro. So 55% in all carbon-free, of, of which 50% of that is, is renewable. And then uh, the power on service, obviously, or power 100, sorry, is, is pretty clear. It's just 100% renewable for only fractions of a, what is it, three, three quarters of a penny more per kilowatt hour. Um, and again, to compare it to, to SDG&E, right, our, our local competitor, so to speak, um, they're currently, as of 2019, I think, uh, they were 31% renewable. Uh, you know, our standard is 50%. Um, I, my guess is that SDG&E will increase a little bit, right? If they <laughs> lose some customers um, without, if they aren't, if they don't fully sell all the renewables, they'll probably tick up a little bit. Um, but again, will be at least 50%, if not more. Uh, and then our Power Power 100 product, of course, 100% renewable. So that's all I have in the first two sections. Um, I've got a thank you slide before the appendices, but I think we still have some time. 
we can get into more some more of the nitty gritty, but I also will happy to open it up for questions if you guys have any at this point. I can keep going. <laughs> okay. So yeah, in the back. So when you say the calendar reference is CA Yeah. Okay, you've been doing the pre-reading also. I see P PCIA didn't expect <laughs> didn't expect many questions on that. Oh, cool. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, challenges certainly. We can we can go into that for <laughs> for the rest of the period here as well. It's not uh, you know it's not not challenge free. Um, and the PCIA, by the way, is the um, uh, oh god, I'm blanking on the term. I'm sorry. This is, this is really embarrassing. Um, is the uh, indifference adjustment. It's, uh, yeah, power, power charge indifference adjustment. Sorry, that, man, I use the term every day. Um, so the PCI is the kind of the exit fee that the CCA customers pay back to the IOUs. So again, take a, a quick step back, right? When renewable energy mandates started, um, you know, and, and pg and &E and Edison and, and sdg &E went out and bought long-term contracts. These were 20, <laughs> 30 year contracts at, at the time that were well above market, right? Kind of paving the way, stimulating the the renewable energy kind of transition a lot of ways, but those contracts were expensive. <laughs> um, so as CCAs have had to have, have moved out, um, it's kind of determined that you know it's only fair that as these IOUs made huge investments uh, on long-term contracts for these customers, that some of that cost would kind of follow the, the customers to the CCA as, as well. So again, conceptually, I, I think that, that makes sense. There's been it's been a contentious topic <laughs> for as long as CC has been around about how that's calculated, right? How, it, how it's administered. Um, but there is an exit fee. So yeah, it certainly is um, one of the challenges of CCA, right? And, and it's not just that you are setting your rates for your generation, but as you kind of, as CCAs compare themselves to the IOUs to be competitive, they need to not only beat the IOU in, charge of the, in terms of their generation rate, but beat their IOU generation rate by the amount of the PCIA or, or the exit fee as well. Um, so, so yeah, so it's certainly something for us, you know, it, it fluctuates with market prices, it fluctuates with the contracts that the IOU served, but it certainly means that, you know, we don't just need to beat, <laughs> from a cost perspective, the IOUs, we need to beat them as well, you know, um, by, by the, the value of the PCIA. Um, so I think that's one, one great challenge. I mean, I mean, the other one also, um, you know, it's not, not included in the slides, but, you know, starting up a utility um, that is, uh, you know, going to go out and, uh, and, and, and be, you know, financeable, right, for long-term contracts um, and, and, you know, is going to serve load and, and may try to beat uh, rates from these IOUs for a long, a long period of time. There, there's credit risk and finance risk involved in that as well. So, um, you know, there was one CCA, the, the first and, and hopefully the, uh, the last, but Western Community Energy what was a CCA in Riverside County. They bankrupt, they declared bankruptcy and kind of went out of business and returned their customers to SoCal Edison uh, earlier this year as well. So <laughs> certainly uh, didn't make my job any, any easier. I, <laughs> I joined SDCP in February. We started serving customers in, in March and have been you know planning and, and building out this uh, this phase in right buying a whole lot of power for for the next couple of years and beyond. Um, and of, of course the the story around CCAs right there, there is a really good kind of finance and credit story that, that goes along, right, with CCAs. We're the default energy provider. We have rate setting authority, right? And, and so there, there's a lot there that is really sound uh, financially as well. But it's a, a conversation I've had to have more uh, the last few months than I, I think I expect or hoped. Um, as everyone says, hold on, you know, see, we were told CCAs were, were gold, you know, but one just, one just went bankrupt, what's going on? Um, so, you know, kind of noting the differences between programs, right, and, and how we consider ourselves to be different from Western community, community energy um, has kind of been been part of the job as well. Um, so I think those are probably the the two the two biggest. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. And that, <laughs> that gets into kind of hey, hey Byron, what do you what do you do every day? Um, so it's a it's a broad mix of power contracts. Um, you know, there's um, 
every utility or load serving entity in California has to buy all of its power from the California ISO, from the independent system operator. I don't know if you guys have been through kind of, um, you know, RTOs and, and ISOs, but um, you know, the California independent system operator, you know, mandates that you buy all your power and, and it, you know, so you're subject to market prices, right? So it makes sense to go out and sign longer term deals, fix your price and fix your cost, to, uh, again, to reduce uncertainty. So, um, so some of it is just kind of financial, financially hedged energy um, on longer term deals than spot market. Um, but also, obviously, all these long term deals that we're signing to support renewable energy facilities, um, you know, being built as well. So a lot of long, I mean, as much as we can, right, because it's increases of renewable energy um, and, and provide certainty, a lot of fixed price long term renewable contracts to support new renewable facilities. Um, that's kind of our, our primary goal where we can, um, as you you know, kind of manage the portfolio and, and mix and match around the edges. There's some short-term contracts as well involved, and then also some, again, just kind of financial hedge products. If I can ask a follow-up. Yeah. Do you deal directly with the ISOs, or do you deal with the energy market producers? Um, that's a good question. So we do both. Um, and when you say, say so I guess we, we have a contract for the, yeah, so... <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry. The question was, do we deal? Thank, thanks, sir. Uh, do we deal with the the energy producer directly or the, the ISO? Technically, it's both. So we have you know basically fixed for floating contracts, um, right? If it's a fixed price deal, um, where we will pay the pay the generator at a fixed price, they'll deliver, they'll sell into the ISO on our behalf usually, and then either they'll collect the revenue or we'll collect the revenue and then kind of pay it back to them. Um, so we are, but you know, SDCP is its own scheduling coordinator. You know, we we have a a third party that kind of provides some of that service for us, but you know we are buying and selling in and out of the market, um, and then but also you know fi settling uh, with our suppliers as well. Good questions. Is there another one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So same same wires, you know, same same pole, same wires. Um, yeah, when you get down to the, I don't know, electron or, or like electric charge, right? Yeah, it's the same throwing through through the wires. Um, you know, a lot of examples around swimming pools and straws and, and all that kind of stuff that you hear about. You know, power grids. Um, but yeah, your money is you know going to the the CCA as opposed to the IOU, and then sourcing at the broader level. Um, you know, the CCA then is sourcing from different sources that the uh, that the IOU is, but but overall, kind of the the ISO is considered a, a balancing authority, right? And so it balances the power. So it's you know you've got to got to put on as much as you take off. Um, so within the, the the whole CC portfolio, right, of which you're one meter or one customer, um, then then yeah, that, that's where the difference is. All right, any other questions? We can. All right, we'll keep moving. And again, through some of these appendices. Um, if it's good conversation, great. If you want me to just keep blowing through it all, that, that's great too. Um, but, so some of the fundamentals here, just uh, again, to orient, I feel like it's really helpful uh, if we zoom way out, just orient ourselves here. Um, <laughs> and I think this is also part of John Oliver's show last night. I don't know how many of you guys have watched it, but WEC and PG&E and got a shout out. So if you guys haven't seen it, feel free to, to go, go check that out as well. Um, but we do have three different... Uh, interconnect, interconnections in, in California, or sorry, in the U.S. So it's not all one one big grid. We have three separate grids that technically do interconnect very you know, slightly, but um, basically the we have three different grids, one of which is, is WEC, and then Texas obviously does its own thing, uh, and then the eastern interconnection is on the far east, you know, kind of the east side. Um, WEC itself uh, is the westernmost 11 states uh, of the U.S., and this is kind of one big piece of machinery all moving <laughs> at the same, the same time, all, um, all at 60 hertz and, and all in sync. So when we talk about, um, you know, sourcing power from different places, it's possible, you know, if you want to purchase energy in Wyoming and, and you know, <laughs> transmit it or, or, or deliver it from there to San Diego or, or wherever or, or British Columbia, you can. Um, within, it does get a little more complicated than that, obviously. You can see all the transmission lines here. 
within the CAISO. Again, the independent system operator kind of runs the grid for California. So we'll zoom in slowly but surely here. Um, California runs the, the market for, for California um, as balancing authority, but then also um, you know, to a lot of these other organizations, it's branching out and trying to integrate uh, the CAISO with other, other entities and other balancing authorities, uh, again, throughout the West. So the more high level, the more, the more interconnection, the more we branch out, the more we can you know, integrate resources from different areas and, and, and kind of lean on each other um, right, in order to produce in times of overgeneration or undergeneration in certain areas. So the more we can kind of co-optimize among different bal balancing authorities. Um, so again, I mentioned the CAISO kind of is, um, you know, I think 85, 90% of, of California. Um, and you can see here, each of those dots, each of those <laughs> colorful dots on the screen is a different pricing node. So just to give you a high level overview of kind of what we're doing, each one of these nodes settles at a different price every hour of every day in the day ahead market. Then, and this is, you know, introduction to energy markets, right? Uh, <laughs> um, then there's the day ahead market, the real time market, and uh, the real time market is broken into 15 minute intervals and then five minute intervals. So if you guys are, uh, in, into big data, uh, you found one great source of it where you have oh, 10,000 pricing nodes. They all have 24, 24 prices in the day ahead market. Then they have whatever uh, uh, 15 minute intervals there are <laughs> in, in the day in the 15 minute market. And then again, through the real time market every five minutes. So they're all repriced it and re-optimized. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the complexity of, of Kaiso. Um, we do pay our load kind of based on an, an average of the, the San Diego um, point. So it's not like a customer down the street, you know, is, is going to be paying a different one as, as another. We buy our load kind of at the aggregate. But when we're buying from a specific resource, we might be buying energy at one of those nodes specifically. So the reason I kind of bring this up is kind of what, <laughs> what we're trying to do. Um, the load that we serve, again, we're trying to buy enough energy uh, from the right resources to, to meet customer demand. So if you look at this, these charts here, uh, the top right is just uh, daily or one hourly customer demand on one day. So hours uh, one to 24 left to right. And you see kind of the shape of energy. And this is across all of, all of the ISO. Um, and, and you can see on the bottom, this is kind of one, I don't know, an average week. Uh, you can see <laughs> the daily variability as well. Um, so you've got the, the daily variability, but you also then have seasonal Seasonal vari variability, you've got weather, you know, weather variability and also just kind of <laughs> days of the week um, or uh, variability as well. I think on the bottom it's, you know, you can see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all weekdays, and then Saturday, Sunday, load drops off as not, not as many people go to work, right? So Thanksgiving, for example, is usually the lowest load day um, just because no one's working, everyone's at home, and, or, but kind of all getting together, and, you know, so no, one, no one's using much energy. So a ton of variability there. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the bottom right chart here just shows over f what is it, five different days how much load can, can vary. Again, this is in, in California, but it's about 35 to 37 gigawatts uh, peak load on September 3rd. I think this is from last year. Uh, and then you know, two days, three days later, it's up to 47,000 uh, or 47 gigawatts. So load forecasting <laughs> is really... Um, important to what we do, right? We, so that, again, talk about applications of, of big data. Um, we've got to buy all of our load out of the California grid, right? And, and those prices, as I said, fluctuate all the time just based on localized supply and demand. So um, this gets to kind of the question earlier about power purchase agreements. The more you can sign uh, contracts to, you know, fix your costs, whether it's through... Um, a bunch of different, different arrangements, but just fixed price energy, whether it's from renewable generators, whether it's from energy storage facilities that we're seeing, especially now in the last couple of years, um, that are online to help move some of this energy around and, and kind of arbitrage prices. Um, you know, that, that's how, how we reduce our exposure to real-time prices and, and to load, load variability. Um, let's see. So, okay, yeah, load forecasting obviously is critical. Uh, and then the matching generation and purchases um, helps us reduce kind of our, our exposure to the real-time market. Um, market prices, and I may leave off after this one or the, the next one here, but market prices, um, <laughs> in the top right chart, you can see those three lines that are pretty well flat and then spike into hours, hours 19, 20, and 21. Um, those are price curves um, for a specific day that's actually, sorry, average for, for last summer, July through September. So you can see that 
during noon, uh, energy is 25, 30 bucks every day. Uh, at 8 p.m., 9 p.m., prices jump up to you know about 100, 150 dollars. Um, and you would see these, this variability every day, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> the prices are highest when your load's highest also. So from a risk perspective, from a cost perspective, um, you, you know, you've got your most load in the most expensive hours. Uh, but again, that's what, when we talk about risk management, um, really is about trying to procure that energy um, cheaply, but also just reducing the variability and, and volatility. Um, and I, I guess <laughs> to, to leave off kind of with where, I think we've got to a couple minutes, is that sound right? Um, with kind of where, where we are in, in California in, as far as our grid mix. Um, we've done a really good job of you know, decarbonizing the, the solar hours. <laughs> you can see uh, the bottom right is a chart of all the different energy resources that we, we have on the grid. Um, solar, no, no, <laughs> no surprise, is the, the yellow one uh, that comes online right around 8 in the morning, uh, peaks at noon and comes offline around you know, hour 19 or 20. Um, and you can see up above the difference between the two charts. One's the kind of gross load need and one's the net load. So the, the gross load is the, the top line. The net is the total load that we serve to customers in California, net of renewables. So you can see we've done a great job of reducing, <laughs> reducing generation and reducing uh, emissions during those periods. Unfortunately, the evening is still kind of uh, our, our issue, right? Because solar, we have a ton of solar, and we've been, you know, building a lot of it. We've done that really well, and we've, we have really decarbonized the middle of the day. The evening, though, if you look on the right side of that lower chart is where you see that blue line, the natural gas line, <laughs> and just go, go straight up, right? Or, or not quite straight, but uh, it peaks there about 18 gigawatts. So, again, this is a summer period, so it'll, we'll use less uh, you know, certainly in the spring when we've got a lot of hydro, when load's lower, this is peak load period. Um, but w this is kind of the, the next frontier, <laughs> so to speak. We do have uh, a lot of work to do to, to kind of completely decarbonize. And, and uh, you know, it, we're, it's exciting to see, I think, one, solar prices being as cheap as they are, and solar plus storage, I think, is kind of the new standard. I think anyone that signs a or builds a, a solar facility now doesn't just build standalone solar, it's solar plus storage. And so we're shifting a lot of that energy from, <laughs> from the, the, yellow, the yellow line into that evening period to shift into the, the afternoon and evening peak. Um, but it really is kind of wh where we are and, 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 and the kind of the next, next focus for us as we try to fully decarbonize. Uh, and the next chart here, again, just kind of the same thing. Um, but you can see s so much solar during the middle of the day. Uh, and then with, with imports and, and natural gas really hitting the, the evening. So the more we can build in-state that, you know, can kind of shift, uh, shift generation and that solar generation in the evening is really going to help us decarbonize because we're still, still building almost as much or still relying upon almost as much natural gas in, in the evening uh, as we have been for a while. So that's kind of the, the state of things, at least from, <laughs> from my perspective uh, in the CCA world. I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, so... Uh, uh, as we, as you laid out, this is really a California deal, the CCAs? Yes. Do you yep. see any interest in this or uptake in this in other states or other countries even at this point? Yeah, great great question. I know there are, um, and I'll embarrass myself by saying I'm, I, f I forget where there are a few other CCAs and kind of uh, a few other um, areas, I think, in the Northeast um, that are allowing CCA in, in some sort. We haven't seen it take... In New York? New York, New England, maybe? Right. Um, yeah, but, but uh, so there are a few other CCAs kind of elsewhere, but nowhere has it taken off kind of as it has in, in California. Um, and, and the big takeaway in some ways for me is that, you know, we have, you know, a lot of the you know, technological solutions. We have a lot of the financing solutions, but so much of it comes down to politics, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so in, in California, it's become, you know, so popular and politicians are, you know, want to, you know, make climate one of their big, yeah. um, one of their big uh, messages and, and and, and focus. So, so we've done it here, and it, it really is when you've got entrenched interests elsewhere. Um, <laughs> not, not to get too cynical, but entrenched inter interests elsewhere, um, yeah. tougher to, to break away. But this may, uh, the trend may go into other jurisdictions. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we're right in the middle of the cop right now, as you know. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I like, uh, one more question is uh, for these students, what advice would you give them on our careers? Are you, do you hire, you know, students, interns, um, if not, and even if so, what would you advise them to do if they wanted to get in on part of the action as you see it? 
Yeah, great, great question. Um, and yeah, first of all, the great thing about kind of again localized CCAs, right? So there's there's one <laughs> in every neighborhood, right? So if you want to stay in the Bay Area, great. If you want to move so to so Southern California, student, start your own. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, talk to me before you do. <laughs> Might have some. <laughs> um, yeah, there certainly are a lot of a lot of opportunities in CCAs, right? I think there's a. Uh, a, a lot of staffing up, right? I mean, SDCP, we're, we're in the middle of that now. We're looking to double kind of in the, in the next year, but most CCAs, you know, are looking to grow and, and looking for, um, yeah, you know, people at, at all all kind of ranges, uh, you know, of, of the professional, you know, whatever, professional development curve. Um, so, yeah, certainly opportunities there. Um, I mean, I think the biggest, you know, again, career advice is just, you know, uh, it, with respect to CCA, just you know, jump in, keep learning. Um, you know, I never expected myself to uh, to end up kind of going into this. You know, in some ways obscure kind of government startup thing. Right? All my all my friends left Stanford and went to do you know some kind of startup work, and here I am <laughs> at a government startup without without stock options. Someone <laughs> didn't get that one right. Um, but but yeah, you, you know, I just went to PG&E and decided to, I'd keep learning how energy works there, and kind of you know, kept kept learning, kept. Uh, following the interesting things and, and you know, kind of end up wh- where I am. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, feel free to re- reach out to me, reach out to your local CCAs. I mean, it's a friendly, collaborative bunch as well. So certainly, to the extent there are are good, um, good, smart people looking to to get involved, you know, happy to be a resource. Great. With that said, uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for giving us this very quick and comprehensive tour of the world of <laughs> the new world of uh, CCAs here in California. Yeah, Thanks, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Sure.